let's get started with our web webinar and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katrina Perlinetto. I am the general manager of Cataraqui Conservation and a member of the Laternal Steering Committee. On behalf of the Committee, Conservation Ontario and the University of Guelph, I'd like to welcome you today to the Other Watershed Cycle, Monitoring, Planning and Restoration, our first webinar of uh, a series that we're holding this fall. We are gathered today in this virtual space from many areas of the province. I, I am speaking to you from the city of Kingston and will begin today with a land acknowledgement. Cataraqui Conservation acknowledges that we are on the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat. As a conservation authority, we are committed to stewardship of the lands we protect and we want to thank the Indigenous people for their care and protection of all the relations of this shared land. I also want to acknowledge that all of you are joining us today from many places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Today, we also wanted to take a moment to recognize tomorrow, September 30th, which marks our first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. It's an important event for all Canadians, and for that reason, we have a few words that I would like to share with you this morning to commemorate this event and encourage you to participate in a truth and reconciliation process. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's definition of reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous people in Canada. In order for that to happen, there has to be awareness of the past, an acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement of the causes, and action to change behavior. September 30th has been declared a statutory holiday for federal employees. However, all Canadians are asked to learn, reflect, and come up with actions that you can do to build better relationships with Canada's Indigenous people. This is the reason the date of our webinar was changed to today, to allow everyone to have the space for, for, for some reflection. Reconciliation is not just one activity, but a series of steps that we can take. We recommend three to start with learn, respect, and create equal partnerships. To learn, first and foremost, is what reconciliation is about. Learning about the history of Indigenous people and the difficulties they experienced in the past and continue to experience today. It is learning about the impacts of colonization, attempts of assimilation, and the legacy that affects Indigenous communities. For respect, reconciliation is respecting the languages, cultures, rights, and title of Indigenous people and letting go of the negative perceptions and stereotypes. It is about making commitment to not accept or ignore a racist comment. And for creating equal partnership, recognize that deep connections are there between Indigenous people to the land. We have an opportunity and obligation to create and support equal partnerships with local communities in conserving, protecting, and restoring the natural resources of our watershed. We encourage all of you to spend some time tomorrow, September 30th, to learn more about the path to truth and reconciliation. To help you with this, at the end of the webinar, we will be sharing links to a wide variety of resources. So take some time to check them out. So moving on with our webinar, again, welcome. This is our first in our Conservation Matters series. We will be holding six webinars on conservation, science, and planning. Over the fall of this year, we'll be bringing you sessions on watershed management, ecological offsetting, ecological monitoring tools, natural asset management for climate change, conservation areas programming, and Indigenous-led land conservation movements. The success of last year's Laternal Leadership Project sorry, Laternal Leadership Project webinar series showed us that despite all being remote, there are still opportunities to meet and network virtually and face-to-face. -face. So we wanted to continue that community of practice and still make space to meet, to share accomplishments, talk about innovations and lessons learned as we work to protect and conserve our watershed environment. I hope you find today's webinar fills some of those gaps, and we look forward to having a good discussion with our panelists as we move forward. So, as watershed practitioners, we are familiar with the living cycle of activities that links watershed planning to implementation and back again. Key in this process is understanding the conditions before and after implementation to best address actions and provide adaptive and integrated management of our natural systems. 
Otherwise, many great actions and intentions take place with very little impact on the landscape. Presentations in this webinar will directly connect watershed monitoring to planning, the active implementation, and back again as part of an integrated watershed management approach. It will showcase a range of conservation authority experiences in developing integrated monitor monitoring programs and using them to inform other conservation authority programs, such as watershed planning and restoration. Many conservation authorities and other environmental organizations are in different stages of developing integrated watershed monitoring programs. This webinar will share first steps and strategies for getting local buy-in to develop and expand monitoring programs beyond provincial networks. The format of our webinar is three presentations followed by a short discussion of curated questions from the floor, which is our Q&A box. So I encourage you to write any questions that you have there and contribute to the conversation, as well as from our participants. A few housekeeping notes for this morning. First, uh, all of our attendees are muted and you will not be able to speak or come on video. You will find the Q&A function, as I've mentioned, at the bottom of your screen. So please put in any comments or questions that you have there. You can also upvote a question that someone else has put in the Q&A by pressing the thumbs up button. And we will be using that to tailor the questions for our panelists. Uh, and feel free to interact with each other as I can see everybody's doing in the chat uh, as we continue our discussion. To our panelists, just a reminder, please use your mute button when you are not speaking. And of course, to unmute yourself when you are. The webinar, as a reminder to everyone today, is being recorded so that members who were able to join with us today have an opportunity to learn and listen at their leisure. So before I introduce our panelists and enough speaking from me, let's take a look at the results of the poll that everybody answered earlier. So it looks like we have a good mix from across the province with uh, those in the GTA kind of winning out. From an affiliation perspective, the majority is conservation authorities, but it's great to see we have participants from multiple different sectors and industries. So thank you for joining. And it's quite a mix. It looks like 50-50 for whether organizations have watershed plans, integrated watershed monitoring programs, but I'm glad to see there's lots of restoration and that there is some intention of doing reviews on these particular plans, which, which is wonderful. So will we use this information as, uh, as benefit to moving things forward, helping us determine different webinars? And I think it'll be helpful to our panelists today to tailor some of their, their talk. So again, thank you everyone for filling those out. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist from CLOCA. So Dan Moore is an aquatic biologist working at Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, or CLOCA. He completed a diploma at Durham College in Environmental Technology, his undergrad at Trent University in Environmental Sciences, and his Master of Environmental Science at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He worked at UTSC looking at better understanding wetland health, evaluating the impact of common carp on Lake Ontario coastal wetlands, and developing tools to advance the science behind setting targets for restoration. At CLOCA, he has coordinated and redesigned the CLOCA Integrated Monitoring Program, assisted with plan review and watershed planning, developed restoration strategies, and evaluated project success. Dan is currently the past president of the Ontario chapter of the American Fisheries Society and the secretary of the Lake Ontario Coastal Wetland Restoration Working Group. So welcome, Dan. Jamie Davidson is the director of watershed planning and natural heritage with the Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority. Jamie has diverse work experiences in mining exploration, terrestrial and aquatic research and monitoring, conservation land management, resource management and restoration and land use planning. This work has taken him across Canada, including Canada's Arctic, Northern BC, and throughout Ontario. Jamie works with a diverse team of technical experts who coordinate a range of programs, including CLOCA's Integrated Watershed Monitoring, Watershed Planning and Implementation, Conservation Land Management Planning, Restoration and Stewardship, and components of the development review process. And so welcome, Jamie. And Roy Mosier is a restoration coordinator for Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority. He graduated from Sir Sanford Fleming School of Environmental and Natural Resources Sciences with a diploma in ecosystem management technology. He has 18 years of experience working in the field of ecological restoration. 
16 of those years has been have been spent working with Ontario's conservation authorities. So welcome, Roy. Welcome, Roy. At this point, I will invite Dan, Jamie, and Roy to turn your cameras on, and I will turn it over to you for your joint presentation. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen okay? We can. All right, thank you. All right, thanks everyone for taking time and your schedules to listen in today. As mentioned, I'm starting the first of three parts outlining the process at Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, also known as CLOCA, for connecting our newly developed marine program to watershed planning and restoration efforts. We have worked hard formalizing meaningful connections in making this process cyclical, and we hope to share some of that this morning. I'll be focusing the first presentation on the development of our new integrated watershed monitoring program. I'm sure as everyone on this call is aware, covering these three topics in 40 minutes, anything but a high level is not possible. Still, we have attempted to pull together some of the key components for an overview, and we'll be happy to discuss further in the Q&A or on another day. COCA initiated formal monitoring programs in 1996, through which we have collected a lot of great data that continues to inform decisions for many business areas internally and externally. But most monitoring programs were initiated at different times and for various reasons. They lacked integration with other departments and management efforts at CLOCA, and the objectives of these monitoring programs have become outdated and no longer relevant. In 2016, we decided it was time for review to reassess what purpose our monitoring served and how we could maximize their value. During, during the early part of the review, there was a lot of soul searching that was required. You needed to ask hard questions about your programs and have an unbiased view asking what is the purpose of the current monitoring programs? Are the monitoring objectives relevant to the current direction of the Conservation Authority? Who uses this information and for what purpose? And how can we improve integration to make our results more powerful? These questions are more difficult to answer than they appear at first glance. Monitoring programs can become very personal for those involved and it is essential to get everyone on the team invested in the idea that change can be good, often necessary to stay current and relevant. Our team started to answer the previous questions by going through these three items, reviewing CLOCA guiding documents, horizon scanning and needs assessment, and internal technical team analysis. I'll go over each of those briefly next. For the first portion, any documents that reference the role of conservation authorities were reviewed to provide direction on the questions CLOCA monitoring program should answer. One theme that kept presenting itself when reviewing our documents is that we wanted healthy watersheds and we need to protect and restore them in order to be healthy. Assuming these statements are meant literally, it would be fair to conclude a monitoring program that can determine the health of our watersheds and how that is changing would be beneficial. Most of our previous monitoring programs were not set up to answer this type of question. It was more of a mass inventory that had proven to be extremely useful especially for plan review purposes and background documents. But as our data sets grew, the return value diminished and data gaps became more apparent in the questions being asked of our newer guiding documents. The second review we completed was what I referred to as a horizon scanning and needs assessment. The text on this slide shows some examples of the topics we asked CLOCA staff from all departments, our municipal and provincial partners, and local environmental groups. Anyone who has tried to solicit information for these projects knows it can be a challenge to engage people, even within your own organization. Still, we felt we were successful in getting a range of feedback that was vital for us to hear from our communities to try to understand their needs, what our niche could be, and how to support internal and external projects in a way that maximizes the value of our programs. Completing this within our Natural Heritage Department alone would leave us out of touch with the needs of the larger watershed communities and decrease our value. This is a snapshot of the technical team internal assessment and is the third and final component of our internal review. It was a method for quantitatively completing our internal soul searching exercise. 
This idea originally came from credit value conservation. I apologize if it's hard to see, but basically you end up with a giant spreadsheet that lists anything you monitor in the rows and how that data is used in the columns. The, the use of data can range from being required for reporting and analysis, or it could be interesting anecdotal or supporting information. A different number is assigned to each level of importance, which helps quantify the value of each monitoring activity. After synthesizing these background review processes and having much discussion, we ended up getting a consensus on the direction for our core monitoring program. The new question to guide this program was decided to be, how is ecosystem health responding as changes in Cloca's watersheds occur? A prominent focus on health and how it is changing over time. As mentioned, we were beginning to realize that this was a miss missing piece of our monitoring programs that became more obvious through review and disconnects with watershed planning development. This is in large part because it's a hard question to answer with confidence. We wanted to answer the same question with our previous monitoring, but realized through analysis, the program was not set up in a way that allowed for the statistical power to address it. The challenge of building a new program to answer this question with confidence was going to be large, but we needed to give it a try. Something not mentioned yet, but worth bringing up is, of course, so much of this is going to come down to resources. Ideally, we would have multiple monitoring programs with different questions that work at different scales. But we had to be realistic throughout this review and concentrate where resources are most needed for valued core programs. Once we had our monitoring question, we started going through the process of developing a cost-effective, relevant, defensible monitoring program that could answer. The points listed on the slide outline some of the components to work through. To start, we decided to use an ecosystem approach, meaning we started to break our watersheds into more measurable components by looking at the representative ecosystems within them. It is a well-established approach in the literature and is easy to communicate. Most common ecosystems have indicators that you can use to break them down further into more measurable components, and I'll dive into this slightly more in a further slide. These indicators need to be sensitive to changes over a reasonable time frame and reflect the threats present in your watershed. Additionally, it is helpful to have a sense of what current conditions are and determine the program's goals. How is success going to be defined? What are we going to try to achieve? I'll start to work through those components here. This is the same figure that now includes the ecosystems and the indicators used for our monitoring programs. Forests are one example ecosystem that we use, easy to understand and communicate to the general public. You cannot measure forest health, but we can break down that community into smaller, more measurable indicators. These can include items such as forest bird community, tree health, and vegetation communities. We then create or adopt local tools for translating the community composition of these indicators to a health score, often using a tool like an index of biotic integrity. It is very important to use an index of biotic integrity or similar tool tailored to your area so it is sensitive to the local threats. There are increasing numbers of these tools becoming available for those who don't want to create their own as it can be time consuming and challenging to create one from scratch. Another important step in the development process is understanding your threats and the relative magnitude of impact. Here's an example closer completed. We based the threats on the tailored list provided by the International Union of Conservation for Nature. Threats were ranked based on their scope, severity, and irreversibility. I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but it's meant to show at a high level how it starts to help you characterize the most significant threats. At a watershed level, there is going to be quite a few of these. It is color-coded to show red as being the biggest threat and green being the smallest. There are several reasons to complete this step. One, to ensure indicators created or adopted are sensitive to local threats in order to reflect changes accurately. This is helpful, helpful for testing or creating tools like the index of bottom integrity. If your indicators are not sensitive to local threats, your results will likely be misleading. Also, to understand how threats contribute to the current and potential state of ecosystems and indicators, to ensure threats are up to date with emerging issues, and to aid in decision making regarding whether or not to intervene when problems arise. 
Here shows an example of how to both visualize and communicate the objectives of the monitoring program, a difficult but important part to quantify. This item is termed the viability assessment and provides a summary of what we have and desire. If we zoom in on the first half, it shows what we're monitoring. In this case, we're just looking at the stream ecosystem example. It also shows the existing data quality and the condition rating for each indicator, which just means how the qualitative labels poor, fair, good, and excellent health relate to the quantitative scores of your indicators. Zooming into the other half of the viability assessment, we list the current and desired status of each indicator monitor. It is important to understand current conditions and answer the difficult question of what we hope to achieve. There has to be consideration for realistic goals to allow for improvement and consensus across the organization. The next presentations will touch on this more, but this is one area we tie into watershed planning process and restoration prioritization to connect our monitoring goals to management objectives. Deciding on what we hope to achieve is difficult, but the watershed planning process and information associated with it helps to make these decisions and embed them within the watershed planning context. That leads well into discussion around intervention and what to do when negative trends move away from the desired health. The role that each organization takes will come down to resources and can range from communicating a problem to complete completing additional targeted monitoring to determine the root cause of the issue and potentially effort to remove this threat and improve the health of the area. Regardless of the approach that is taken, building partnerships and having effective communication is critical for this step. Once again, this topic is tied directly to other programs that will be discussed through the watershed planning and restoration prioritization presentations to follow. Integration between these three programs makes intervention or some sort of action in general based on results more feasible than to have it only as a component of the monitoring program. Good communication is critical to stay relevant, integrated, and maintain connections to management, partners, and support in general for monitoring programs. Not only is communicating externally challenging at times, but internal communication has to be a priority as well. Keeping CLOCA staff updated and engaged on what is happening in the watershed with everyone's busy schedules can be difficult but important. Same for external communication. There's so much competition on various media platforms. Having a well laid out communication strategy is key and ideally professional or at least very creative people to help share these messages is a huge asset. One of the media types we have found to be most successful is our story map. I've shown a screenshot of it here and you can find it on the local website. It hosts all of our data in a way that is easy to access and navigate. There is background information, but only at a very high level the average user needs. For more interested parties, a technical report is produced every five years. A few lessons learned that come to mind. Think long-term. Financially, hard decisions will have to be made in considering what and how many things to monitor, ones that are cheaper but still provide high quality data that accurately reflects the health of your ecosystem will be critical. But don't cheap out too much on this. Spending a bit extra to provide high resolution data to get more confidence in your results can save you a lot of trouble and headaches in the future. Find your niche that makes your data valuable to a larger group. Horizon scanning and needs assessment contributes to this by helping to understand how your data is unique and valuable to multiple organizations. Considering, consider emerging threats and how to put yourself in a place to be rich with data when needed. This connects to thinking long-term. It takes time to collect their data. Communication, communication, communication throughout the process and after. This is probably quite obvious, but it can't be overstated. When we were originally asking internal and external staff for feedback on our programs, the most common question we got was, can you remind us what you do? This response will always happen periodically, especially with partner agencies but it did highlight to us that improved communications could help our programs be more remembered and therefore relevant. Setting expectations is also important. You want to build momentum and interest in the program internally and externally, but you also want people to understand what your program can and can't answer as you make your decisions. And finally, there will be lots of bumps in the road. This is generally not a linear process, but requires lots of back and forth as different options, scales, modern frequency, budgets, et cetera, are considered. Is all worth it in the end. 
For anyone thinking of going through this and is potentially intimidated by, by the process, I wanna mention a couple of the resources available to help guide organizations. The two I leaned on the most was the Open Standards for the Practice of Conservation Framework and Credit Valley Conservation. Open Standards has a great website, training resources, examples that can walk you through that process. Similarly, Credit Valley Conservation has excellent support and documentation that I'm sure you'll hear more about from Levine in a few minutes. And of course, I'm always happy to help, so please feel free to reach out to me. Admittedly, being a small to medium-sized CA with moderate financial and staff resources, this process was intimidating at first, but many people are able and willing to provide the advice and support, and it is possible. Well, that is all for my presentation. I will hand it over to Jamie Davidson, who will continue the closer presentation on the watershed planning process. Thanks, Dan, for teeing up the uh, watershed planning component of this morning's presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to keep things going with the next component in this other watershed cycle we're talking about this morning. Dan took you through the monitoring and assessing and started to touch on the evaluation component of this integrated feedback loop. I'm going to focus on the evaluation watershed planning and recommendation setting st uh, stages of this loop. For us, much of this work happens through our watershed planning process, which I'll take you through. And hopefully I'll set the stage for Roy, who will highlight how we move from recommendations into one other area of implementation. Then from there, the feedback loop starts all over again. So first, a brief overview of our watershed planning history. In the early 2000s, CLOCA began assembling existing condition report, reports for our four major watersheds. Using the 10 to 15 years of base data collected through our earlier monitoring programs that Dan discussed briefly. These existing condition reports were completed in 2012. CLOCA completed its first series of modern watershed plans in 2012-2013 for the four watersheds that originate on the Oak Ridges Marine primarily in support of its partner municipalities who were required to update their official plans in order to conform to policies contained in the Oak Ridges Marine Conserv Conservation Plan that was relatively new at the time. These plans took what we knew about our watersheds, which was documented in our existing conditions reports, and laid out a series of recommendations on how to improve watershed health and manage the watersheds going forward. The 2012 watershed plans identified, identified 24 action plans that need to be completed by CLOCA in order to fill knowledge gaps and assist with future goal setting. And in some cases, these plans were needed to provide answers to questions that the monitoring data at the time just could not answer. A series of policy statements were also drafted in the watershed plans in order to make it easier for municipal partners to incorporate the watershed plan recommendations into their official plans. And over 60 indicators were identified in each watershed plan as measures of watershed health, with somewhere around 100 corresponding targets that needed to be reached in order to move back towards a healthy watershed condition. And you'll see later that 100 targets is a lot. In 2017 2018, five years after the first watershed plans were completed, OCA initiated an update to all four original plans. So, why a five year update? A lot had actually happened in five years. In particular, the province released an update to the trilogy of important land use policy documents, including the Growth Plan, the Greenbelt Plan, and the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan. These three plans provided new direction with respect to land use planning and watershed planning in particular, and required municipalities to undertake municipal comprehensive reviews and update their official plans. In addition to updating population forecasts for the province, we're showing a 72% expected growth in Durham region and a doubling of the population in the Cloca jurisdiction by the year 2041. We know that this population growth will result in greater land use change and place more pressure on existing natural heritage and water resources. We also know that the impacts associated with this growth 
growth will likely be intensified by changing climate. Durham Region's Community Climate Adaptation Plan suggests that the region will experience warmer, wetter, and wilder conditions going forward, and calls for the need to build and maintain communities and watersheds that are more resilient to change if we want to experience healthy communities in the future. Cloak had also worked very hard to fill in a lot of those outstanding knowledge gaps identified in their original watershed plans by completing 16 of the 24 recommended. We found through the development of these action plans or detailed planning tools that it's at this more refined planning level where the real details lie for specific indicators of watershed health. These tools provide specific and measurable recommendations from which realistic goals and objectives can be established in a higher level type watershed plan. Some of the completed plans included the Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program, the Wildlife Corridor Protection Enhancement Plan, the Riparian Corridors Restoration Plan, and the Restoration Prioritization Model, to name a few. So recognizing all of this new information, CLOCA started down the road of updating its watershed plans. This began with a series of consultation sessions to make sure we were developing updated plans that met the needs of our partners, stakeholders, et cetera. We set to work updating our base data we, that we knew had changed and started pulling together new data sets required by the new provincial policy documents, including mapping the water resource system. So I can tell you that the process to update the watershed plans was flawless. The original plans were perfect and all we had to do was duplicate them, but really the truth lies somewhere in the middle. The original watershed plans were ex excellent documents. But at the time, we were just starting to learn how to build watershed plans and the programs that support their development. Through the recent process to update the plans, we encountered some challenges and some issues, of course. While difficult to work through at the time, we think the final 2020 watershed plans benefited as a result. We now have updated watershed plans that integrate and reflect our diverse program areas across the organization and have buy-in from staff responsible for these programs, which should enhance implementation access success. So one of the big challenges we encountered was the watershed planning evaluation framework. We'd learned a lot through identifying specific indicators, developing goals and objectives that are smart, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Through the development of our integrated uh, monitoring program, as Dan described, so we were as a group teaming with this newfound knowledge. And when we started to evaluate the progress made towards achieving the goals outlined in the original watershed plans and comparing the changes and in indicate indicators against targets, we began to realize that many of the indicators and targets were not specific and could not be re re readily measured. As a result, it was proving really difficult to evaluate change in watershed health over the last five years using the evaluation framework that was prevent, presented in the original watershed plans. We knew if we didn't make a change at this time, we'd be fighting this challenge during every watershed plan update going forward. We also had our new integrated watershed monitoring program that was focused on answering the very question we wanted to answer through our watershed plans. How is ecosystem health responding as changes in Clocus watershed occur? As a result, the time was right to integrate our new monitoring program into watershed into our watershed planning framework. We use the same conservation and restoration planning framework approach that was used to develop our integrated monitoring program to help identify targets, identified, uh, identify corresponding attributes, establish measurable, precise, consistent, and sensitive indicators. This established a new framework for our watershed plans. The majority of the indicators are monitored annually through our integrated monitoring program. So we know we'll have quality data supporting our decision-making in future watershed plan updates. We also updated the evaluation tables to reflect the new framework and to incorporate as much information as possible in one location for quick reference for our partners. This includes defined 2041 goals for each indicator and a visual status style that shows the change in status against the defined goals. While there's no perfect way to represent all this information, we feel we've landed on a pretty good template. In keeping with the conservation and restoration planning framework off of which we based our new watershed planning framework, we established three strategies that we're going to use to help guide our work and achieve our watershed plan vision. 
Each strategy includes a number of very specific short-term objectives that we hope are accomplished over the next five years. For example, achieving a 1.6 increase in forest cover in a particular watershed. No progress could be reported on these watershed plan updates uh, in this particular watershed up plan update because these short-term objectives were new to the framework. Finally, we outlined a series of actions, some new, some old, that would be required to help us achieve these short-term objectives. Recognizing that achieving watershed health cannot be accomplished by a conservation authority on its own, we identified actions for CLOCA, our municipal partners, and for the general community. The two highlighted under the CLOCA column include the ones we're focusing on today, including the implementation of our integrated watershed monitoring program, outlined by Dan earlier, and developing and implementing a stewardship and restoration program that will be discussed by Roy next. I know I've thrown a lot of terms around that might be difficult to follow if you're new to these kinds of planning frameworks. We also found that with the public as well. So we developed the following schematic to help understand the flow of our watershed planning framework. First, we identify our conservation targets or ecosystems that the literature shows are critical to watershed health. This one follows through the natural cover conservation, conservation target. One attribute of natural cover is forest cover. The indicator or what we can measure of that attribute is percent forest cover. We've identified a 30% forest cover goal within most of our watershed plans. One strategy we will use to achieve the goal is to conserve, enhance, and restore ecosystems. We've defined a number of actions that will help us deliver on this strategy and achieve the short-term objectives that have been established for forest cover. So for example, because the current status of forest cover is 17% in the Lynn Creek watershed, the collective we need to work towards a gain of 213 hectares or 1.6% gain of forest cover every, every five years if we want to achieve 30% forest cover goal by 2040. So if you want to avoid the coming storm and experience that ever elusive double rainbow instead, here are a few other lessons learned that we may be able to elaborate more on the following panel discussion. Internal buy-in is paramount. It's really hard for one department and only a few staff to, to be responsible for driving the watershed planning process forward and even harder to see the plan implemented. It's very important to establish a strong cutoff date for data as we all have a tendency and desire to use the most current data available as the plan develops, but changing midstream has repercussions. Interpreting vague policy direction can be challenging, so don't try not to do it in isolation. Watershed plans are meant to guide both conservation authorities and their partner municipalities manage resilient watersheds. So it's imperative that you work with your partner municipalities to ensure the plans are also meeting their needs. Watershed plans won't implement themselves, so you need to be constantly communicating with the players to develop. It. And finally, as part of the communication piece, you need, to get, you need to get the watershed plans and the key messages out to the broader community if you hope to get help, to get the help you that you need to implement the plans. Just briefly, here are some of the products we developed to make the watershed plans accessible. We developed a high level story map that provides an introduction to watershed planning that's aimed at the general public. Quick links to the full plans are available for those wanting more. The full reports are available in the standard PDF format. These were tailored to the informed public, stakeholders, and municipal partners who we really want to read the documents front to back. And quick links to all the supporting action plans within the document. And you can get to the re de real details um, quickly as needed. And finally, we developed the discover tool for all our watershed plans. This is for the practitioner who knows the plan front to back, but wants to access certain information quickly and interact with the mapping. The tool allows for quick access to sections. You can download individual sections, figures, tables, and many of the figures are under integrated with interactive mapping. So where do we go from here? With the plans approved by our board of directors, we're now focused on the implementation side of the process, which Roy will touch on one aspect of that implementation 
in the next presentation. Changes in the watershed will be continuously assessed through our monitoring work. This constant feedback, feedback loop will help us update, adapt, and renew our watershed planning work going forward. So without further ado, um, Roy, it's over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, morning, everyone. My name is Roy Mosier. I am the Restoration Coordinator for the Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority. I'll be presenting on the role that restoration plays in completing the integration loop between monitoring, planning, and implementation. So the first question we ask is why do we restore? Why not just leave it for nature to take its course? Well, in restoration, we are almost always dealing with areas that have been impacted in some way by human activity. The damage and disturbance created by these activities can be irreparable without some intervention. Therefore, we restore to repair this damage, to return a semblance of the composition, structure, and function of a healthy, resilient ecosystem. We restore to offset the effects of climate change. If we do not replace the trees and other ecosystem components that, we have, that have been destroyed, we have severed all of the important ecosystem connections that existed before. Science recognizes that we are in a global cr climate crisis and it is becoming increasingly important to do our very best to reverse or at the very least slow this trend of climate change. Restoration helps to sustain biodiversity. Often site disturbance will result in the establishment of low quality ecosystems composed mainly of invasive species. After actual habitat loss, invasive species pose the biggest threat to biodiversity globally as they displace native flora and fauna and will dominate ecosystems, limiting the quality and quantity of the species that can grow. By controlling invasives and planting native species, we can preserve some of the biodiversity that is so important to our native wildlife and ecosystems as a whole. Through outreach and action, we can encourage and inspire people to practice good stewardship practices. There are opportunities on every single privately owned property, whether it be urban backyard or a 500 acre farm, to improve the way that we manage the land. By increasing engagement and involvement with landowners, restoration activities can be conducted at the landscape level to greatly improve the health of our watersheds as a whole. Science is also telling us that there is a direct link between nature and human health, and by strengthening this link, society as a whole benefits. Lastly, by conducting restoration, we integrate the science into the implementation that will help us to quantify the benefits that we realize through having a fully integrated monitoring program. So now that we know why we restore, the question is how do we go about it? And the natural starting point is to review all of the supporting documents available to guide our science-based restoration decisions. Jamie mentioned the many documents that have been developed by CLOCA in particular to help with these decisions. Our watershed plans really provide the main guidance for our restoration goals and objectives in each of our watersheds. It outlines and quantifies the standards that we wish to meet in order to maintain healthy ecosystems throughout our jurisdiction. Next, we look at our existing monitoring data to help identify priority areas for restoration in the watershed. Much of this data is captured in our restoration prioritization tool. This tool ranks each of the catchments within our jurisdiction and assigns it a prioritization score based on a number of monitoring data sets. This allows us to quantify the benefits that may be achieved through restoration activities within that catchment over time. Next, we need outreach and communication to raise awareness and to connect us with landowners and partners who may have interest in participating in restoration activities. Through the use of multimedia, communication, communication materials and direct outreach, we can reach a large number of people within our jurisdiction. We have the knowledge and expertise to deliver on a whole suite of restoration opportunities that can be catered to landowner objectives and customized to include the best ecological gains for the watershed. Next, we need to provide all of the equipment, labor, and hard goods to achieve the actual work on the ground. This could mean procuring contractors to complete the work, completing the work in-house, or enlisting volunteers to help achieve on-the-ground implementation. Of course, with limited financial resources, funding sources are always sought to ease the fiscal burden of completing restoration works, which makes the establishment of partnerships and ongoing positive relationships with other agencies of utmost importance. 
Finally, once restoration is complete, more monitoring will be required to assess the effectiveness of the project, as well as to track changes toward meeting our watershed goals and objectives as identified in our watershed plans. This closes the loop and allows the process to start over for monitoring and loop back through the integration process. Here's a list of the suite of services that can be offered to cover the range of restoration opportunities that may be available at any given site. From tree planting to forest management, stream and wetland restoration, grassland restoration to invasive species control. I'll cover some, cover some of these briefly in the following slides just to give an idea of what is involved in each of these restoration categories. So afforestation refers to the planting of trees in large blocks or windbreaks to reestablish tree cover on lands that have been cleared for agricultural or other purposes. It involves the planting of mainly coniferous trees in densely spaced rows with the idea that these will be thinned out as they mature to establish what will eventually be a mixed or hardwood forest. Thinning over time opens up canopy gaps and allows sunlight to penetrate to the forest floor, promoting the regeneration of shade tolerant hardwoods in the understory of the coniferous plantation. Aforestation is a well-known and effective technique for simulating and speeding up natural succession. These two slides are interesting. They uh, were both taken by me from the same spot on the same trail within a wood lot uh, for which I was doing a managed forest plan. Um, when I look to the left, I see the left hand uh, photo. It is of a pine, red pine plantation that had not been thinned or managed in any way. You can see that there is complete canopy closure and no regeneration in the understory. When I look to the right, I took this second photo. This is a Scots pine plantation that had been thinned about, at about 25 years. And you can see that there is very healthy regeneration of sugar maple in the understory and that it is well on its way to becoming a mixed hardwood forest. This just reinforces the fact that ongoing management of plantations is needed to reach the climax community for which afforestation is intended. Forest objectives can also be reached by helping landowners enroll in managed forest tax incentive program. This program is designed to promote good forestry practices on privately owned woodlots in Southern Ontario through the preparation of a managed forest plan. To be eligible, landowners must own at least four acres or uh, 9.88 acres of forested land, must have a managed forest plan approved and submitted by a managed forest plan approver, and must adhere to good forestry practices when conducting management activities within their woodlot. Landowners enrolled in this program enjoy a 75% tax reduction on the eligible forested area. Naturalization um, is usually conducted on marginal farmlands, riparian areas, or any other open areas with the purpose of expanding and enhancing the natural heritage system, increasing riparian buffers, and increasing biodiversity. It refers to the planting of a diverse mix of potted native trees and shrubs, these trees and shrubs are generally larger in size with a more diverse species composition than an afforestation. Grassland restoration. Um, it is estimated that less than 3% of Ontario's historical grass, native grasslands remain today. And grasslands are the most endangered of the world's ecosystems. Ground nesting birds such as bobolink and eastern meadowlark have shown dramatic declines over the past few decades and are now listed as threatened on the species at risk list with habitat loss being the main reason. We have also seen significant decli declines in po pollinator populations. Planting native grasslands on eligible properties can help to provide this vital habitat to a guild of grassland species. Invasive, invasive species management is designed to improve habitat for native species through the removal of invasive exotics by a manual or chemical treatment. By removing these species, we can control the extent and impact of the invasive species and reestablish native species in those areas. The photo on the left here shows us treating a dense patch of dog strangling vine dominating the understory in one of our plantations. The photo on the right is the same plantation one year later. It is our hope that by thinning this plantation and treating the invasive species, we will be able to establish healthy regeneration of native hardwoods, trees, and native herbaceous woodland plants. Wetland restoration is designed to reestablish, rehabilitate, repair, or create wet wetland habitat. This photo is of a newly created wetland at our Lynn Shores Conservation Area, which is 
newly opened with new parking access off of Halls Road, if you care to uh, pay us a visit. Stream restoration is designed to improve stream habitat through various activities, including bioengineering, stream stabilization, stream barrier removals, riparian plantings, etc. The photo on the left here shows a newly restored stream bank at our Heber Down Conservation Area. Ebian baskets, which hardened and channelized the banks, were removed, and a natural stream bank was restored, one that will be more dynamic with the stream flow and erosion that will take place naturally over time. Erosion control, erosion control coir blanket was installed and it was planted with native trees and shrubs and a grassland mix to stabilize the banks and provide shade and habitat for the fish in the stream. The photo on the right shows where we removed a culvert and restored natural channel along a stream which bypasses a large online pond. By bypassing the pond and restoring the stream, we will reestablish important cold water habitat for this sensitive headwater stream. So what do we achieve through restoration? Well, we achieve many of the goals and objectives laid out in our watershed plans, including forest cover, increasing forest cover, natural cover, riparian cover, wildlife corridor activity, and wetland cover, as well as improving fish passage through our rivers and streams. All of this in addition to the many other intangible or otherwise immeasurable benefits to the environment that we realize. By integrating restoration with our watershed monitoring and planning, we hope to be able to quantify these positive changes over time. That's it, happy restoring. This is not me, this is our former uh, terrestrial biologist, Diana, and uh, we had a lot of fun on this dog strangling vine removal project. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Dan, Jamie, and Roy. That was an excellent foundation for our participants this morning. Some of the takeaways that I got is that it's a very thorough process to try and pull together watershed planning initiatives. It takes a lot of buy-in, lots of communication. There's challenges along the way, but I think if you start with defining what is success and finding your niche, as, as Dan said, then you're setting yourself up for some really, really meaningful work. And congratulations to your team and, and pulling all those resources together and developing the templates and using other resources. I'm sure many of our participants will want to reach out to you for more comments and, and maybe sharing some of those templates when they're at the same stage at their own organization. Okay, so uh, that leaves us to our next presenter, which is Loveline Clayton from Credit Valley Conservation. Loveline Clayton is the Acting Manager Landscape Science Monitoring and Inventory at Credit Valley Conservation. Born and raised in the growing city of Brampton, Loveline became interested in the impacts of urbanization on the natural environment. She took that interest with her to the University of Guelph, where she graduated with the first class of the Environmental Science Program. Loveline has been at Credit Valley Conservation for 25 years. During her time there, she has worked on a variety of projects and programs such as the Credit River Fisheries Management Plan, Joint Health and Safety Committee, Flood Forecasting and Warning Program, and a number of sub-watershed sub studies. Her work on the Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program began when she started as a summer uh, student work, a summer worker, my apologies, leading the fish component. Today, she leads the Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program team, comprised of subject matter experts in the field of statistics, study design, reporting, and a variety of abiotic and biotic components. Welcome, Loveline, and I turn it over to you. Thanks, Katrina, and thanks, Cloca, for a great setup. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I will provide you with a quick overview of Credit Valley Conservation's Integrated Watershed Monitoring Program, or IWIMP for short, how it has evolved over time, and then building on Dan's presentation um, and Jamie's and Roy's as well, sharing some key considerations or lessons learned for a successful long-term monitoring program. So CVC, um, tracks the conditions and trends in our watersheds ecosystems to guide our priorities and resources. The four watershed ecosystems we monitor for are streams, forests, groundwater, and wetlands. We also monitor for two drivers, which are forces that shape the attributes that monitor that we monitor in our ecosystems, namely climate, climate and landscape. In 1996, CBC had significant budget cuts across our authority. And during that time, there were discussions to initiate a long-term monitoring program. In the spring of 1999, IWIMP was born. This means, <clears throat> oh, sorry. 
This means our monitoring program is 23 years young this year. By the time you were 23 years old, what did you think you would accomplish? Did you think you were established or did you assume you would grow and evolve as the years went on? Just like a young 20 something, our program has only just begun to settle into our program life. And in the next few slides, I'll quickly explain some of our challenges to date and how we've evolved to overcome them. The foundation of any monitoring program is the data that is collected. But one thing we've realized is that we have to spend just as much or more time working the data as we did collecting it. This knowledge pyramid shown on this slide recognizes that data is critical to making wise decisions. CBC is striving to improve every step of this pyramid. And for our monitoring data, this includes data quality and the efficiency, accessibility, and security of our data sets. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is a work in progress. We are working with our corporate information management team to develop solutions such as transitioning to SQL. We are also automating data collection where possible and CBC as a whole is working towards an open data strategy. Once the data is cleaned up and organized, the next challenge is data summarization and analysis. Some of our current databases are not summarizing the data in the way we need them to and the manual summaries we do in the interim has mistakes and can take a long time to complete. So until we complete our transition over to a more robust information management system, our team is using R to automate some of our summaries. Another challenge is analysis. Recently, staff completed a status and trend analysis for all 153 metrics and spent time researching the best way to analyze the data. After testing a few methods, we settled on using general linear mixed models and general additive mixed models. Once the data is clean, the summarizations and analytical models are complete, we can then run integrated analysis for sites, areas, or issues to determine next steps. And once the data is summarized and analyzed, we have the challenge of transforming that information to knowledge through communication products. IWIMP has been sharing information since it began in 1999. However, how we share our information has evolved. In the beginning, our main method of relaying knowledge was through annual reports. However, these reports were long, detailed, and geared towards a very technical audience, not at all appropriate for decision makers or other stakeholders. In 2014, we switched to a more visually appealing annual report that was considerably shorter and contained plain language, but still a lot of work to put together and not quite fulfilling our needs. Now we are creating more tailored products to meet the needs of the target audience. In response to our municipal partners, we have moved towards a more visually appealing format, and we have placed a greater emphasis on the so what of a monitoring result and calls to actions. Examples of our target products include social media, landowner packages, and our most recent example, the IWIMP Story Map Collection, which we just launched this month on our website. We're also starting to use novel data visualization approaches to tell the story of what we're seeing across the watershed. Animated graphics that display both spatial and temporal data simultaneously is a powerful way to hit the message home. This example is from one of our stories in the IWIMP story map collection showing mean air temperature increasing over time and was produced in R. When we were refined our program in 2014, we knew we knew we needed to document our goals, protocols, etc. for our own reference, but we also knew these documents would be important to share with others to help them design or refine their long term monitoring programs as well. The result is the IWIMP reference series. Volume one includes an overview of the program. Volume two outlines the procedures we follow to implement our monitoring plan. And volume three will outline a communication strategy, including creating personas for our key audiences and developing a strategy for communicating results to each. Another challenge we had was ensuring our results translate into action. What happens with our results once they're published? How is CBC following through? The result is a framework that we produced in 2020 called IWIMP Results to Action. And essentially the process involves IWIMP staff sharing priority results to key groups across CBC. Project sponsors identify themselves to lead reasonable actions, which may involve working with internal and external parties. If the cause of a monitoring result is unclear, then the reasonable actions are not clear either. Staff can then investigate further, potentially through CBC's cause and effect program. We've only just begun to embark on this process, but we are optimistic it will be a success. We have received positive feedback from our senior staff who will be implementing this framework and our team will be working with them over the next while to help them understand the key issues and develop reasonable action plans for the near future. So that's a quick snapshot of our program challenge and how we've tackled them along the way so far. 
I'll now just quickly summarize some key considerations when creating or refining a long-term monitoring program. A monitoring program is not just data collection, but what you do with the data. The management, analysis, and reporting of the data need to be given the same due consideration as the data collection itself. You need to spend the time to design and regularly refine your program to make that happen. You need the right staff to help you with the whole monitoring cycle as well. Staff can obviously take on multiple roles, but you can't expect the same person to do all the steps from collection to reporting in a meaningful way in a timely fashion. Consider taking a more corporate approach, perhaps collaborating with other agencies or CAs as an option. And that leads me to my third point, developing relations with people both internally and externally. Learn from each other and leverage each other's resources and expertise. Regularly review your program to ensure you're keeping up with the science and meeting the needs of your partners. The monitoring program's true value comes from sharing our knowledge to ultimately maintain and improve condition. Change is inevitable, but always keep the integrity of the data and the science at the forefront. And lastly, share the value importance of your work regularly. This can help garner support for your program, particularly with your municipalities and with your, your own conservation authority. Monitoring data is the silent partner for so much of our work at a conservation authority and those of our partners. We must do our part to remind them how important this foundational information is and the value lost if we don't continue. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Loveline, for an excellent presentation. Some of the key concepts that uh, stuck, up, stuck out for me include, I, I think it's a really important concept that you can't just plan to, to, to take data. You've got to be able to manage it. You have someone in charge of that. And you have multiple people in a project team taking on that responsibility. Some of the different organizations are very small, capacity is limited. So having those relationships, those external partnerships and relying on everybody's expertise, I think is critical. Those visual graphics that you've shown are also, I think a great tool that some of us can employ to help with that communication to express our value on some of these programs. So thank you for that perspective and for your work in, uh, in this particular area. So we'll move on to our last presenter, Ian Ockenden. Ian Ockenden is a watershed monitoring specialist at the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. His career in water quality and water resource management has spanned the public and private sectors domestically and internationally for over two decades. At the NVCA, he oversees surface water data collection, but as with many smaller CAs, he also wears many different hats depending on the day. Within the burgeoning integrated watershed management program at the NVCA, Ian fulfills the unofficial roles of data analyst, scientific translator, and magician as he endeavors to redesign the NVCA's monitoring program for the future. So with that, and last but not least, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katrina. Let me just load up my presentation here. All right, can everybody see that? Oops, we there can. We go. There if we go. you can just put it full screen, perfect. Yeah, no, I was just stuck for a second. All right, so as Katrina introduced myself, my name is Ian Ockenden. I am going to present to you the integration of the NBCA's monitoring program. After two great presentations by CLOCA and CVC, if you are in a small to medium-sized CA, you're scratching your head saying, that's all great, but what can I do? Um, and I'm going to show you what I attempted to do or am attempting to do. So brief outline, a little bit of program history and my experiences with integrating the monitoring program. Oops. So the MVCA watershed, just to put up, situate us, we're west of Lake Simcoe and Barrie, and we drain into Georgian Bay, Wasaga Beach. We are a predominantly agricultural watershed, though we are urbanizing. We are the leading edge of the GTA's expansion north, so we are starting to see a lot of development. So the watershed monitoring program was uh, began, it initiated with a watershed management plan in 1996 that listed watershed monitoring as a core priority for the organization. So following a board resolution, it started. We had eight lofty program goals at the start and they included everything you'd dream of, integration with other internal programs, integration with municipalities and other partners, measurable targets to hit and everything. It was almost a panacea you could ask for. 
But then in reality, we were and are a small program. At the time, there wasn't even a full-time staff. It was one part-time staff shared between a couple programs. The entire endeavor was funded through special paid projects and there were no formal integration workflows. How were they each, each program gonna talk to each other? So as the program went through its teenage years, um, it eventually got a full-time staff person and we got really good at collecting data. Um, we suffered from the reporting and analyzing dilemma of we just didn't do enough. So in, 19, in 2018, I decided it was time to shake things up. Uh, I felt, came across the Canadian Council of Ministries Environment document on optimizing water quality monitoring programs, and that kind of got me going. And I started looking at the Ganner Aska and CVC's first documents. Uh, Cloca was in progress at the time, and I had some good discussions with Dan about how to do all this. Uh, so as in the CA world, we like to talk to each other. We like to figure out lessons learned, what we can do best based on what other people are doing. So I surveyed everybody. Uh, I found out almost everybody monitors, but almost everybody doesn't have any documented reason why. Uh, and that's what we had as well. Uh, monitoring is a tiny part of most CA's budgets. Uh, and we all focus on local needs, which is very interesting because we all do some different things meaning it's impossible to find a one-size-fits-all answer. I can't just take Cloca's document, change the Cloca to NDCA and say I did one. I had to actually write my own. So I developed a plan, had some rough ideas, and I took it to management, and they said yes. Um, I don't mean to sound surprised, but sometimes you come up with some ideas and you don't know what reaction you'll get. Um, it was at the exact same time as the NDCA completed the Integrated Watershed Management Plan. This is a document that was funded by the Canadian Association of Municipalities, and it was had a very strong climate change bent to it, but we also used it to kind of do a watershed-wide series of plans. Um, lacking, we, we are lacking at a CA of some watershed plans or watershed plans, so we kind of use this as a, a, another means of getting to that information. The next step with managerial approval was to talk to the other departments. What can I do for you? And I got a lot of blank stares. Uh, we, we are great at doing informal discussions. When you run into somebody, how can we work together? But we didn't have those obvious formal paths for integration. And that's what we need to work on. So getting my own house in order, uh, 23 years of program data, 58 of the PWQMN, lots of data. Uh, COVID helped out a lot, gave us a lot of time to clean this up. We found a lot of orphan data, data that had no site, so I didn't know where it was from. We had a lot of non-standard methods in the past, and we had a big box of old data written on recipe cards that had to get in and formalized somehow. NVC also doesn't have a data management system. We don't have a database, which means this is even a greater challenge. So what I need to do is design an integrated program. How? It needs to meet board objectives, our, our strategic plan goals and objectives. I would not write one if it wasn't sound scientifically and statistically valid. And it has to be realistic based on our staffing and budgets. I can't do a 23 person program. I'm mostly my, myself with some contract staff. Data analysis. I really want to have grading of each criteria that I can update annually, give it a pass, a fail, an ABC, something like that. So I've got some ideas for different avenues of what we monitor. And I'm looking at, I'd love to do trends on a 10 year cycle. Uh, I'd love to get at what's changing in the watershed. I'm starting to play with this and you can tell some of this has gone from what I've done to what I aspire to do. Um, this is very much a work in progress. And I'm finding statistically, I have insufficient power to comment on trends and some key parameters, such as total phosphorus. Um, that is gonna be a challenge. It means the provincial water quality network in our area doesn't provide enough data for me to talk about phosphorus. So we need to look at other avenues. So in reporting, uh, I really like the data dashboard approach that Cloca, CVC, TRCA are using, and we would aspire to have something similar. I'd love to put in those annually updated grades and possibly some trends. I really want to get away from writing big technical reports that nobody reads. It's a waste of everybody's time. I'd really like to aim for like quick sound bites, social media posts, things like that. But I don't do that, so I don't know how to do that. So that's a challenge for myself in the future and our communications coordinator to have some discussions about how that's going to happen. 
And lastly, the biggest challenge is integration. I have some wild and crazy ideas that only would work if I ruled the world, um, but how would it work in reality? Um, I was very interested to see how Jamie was gonna present and what Cloca does, uh, see what we can take from there and how we can make it work. It's still very much a work in progress. I need to sit down more with each of our programs to figure out where we can all make this fit. So thank you very much. Great, thanks Ian for your presentation. And I think you'll find that many CAs and other organizations are probably in a similar boat and just trying to figure out, you know, based on our capacity, how, how do we move things forward? How do we get buy-in internally? And then how do we, you know, turn that into a meaningful uh, program, especially the data management piece that I know there's been lots of discussions across different organizations on how to tackle that and make sure that you integrate uh, the different parts of your organization. So thank you for your perspective and on, uh, on some of the efforts that you've been doing at NVCA to get this rolling. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their wonderful presentations. And at this time, I'm gonna ask that all of our panelists turn their cameras on so that we can begin a bit of a discussion. We have a series of questions for our panelists and we've also been seeing some questions in the Q&A box. So I do encourage everyone to continue to put your questions in that space and we will filter and be able to, to bring those up for discussion. So uh, I will start with one of the popular questions that our panelists have already answered, but I think it's worth highlighting just because it, it did get a lot of votes for it. So one of the questions that was posed is how are watershed plans and subsequent action plans funded? And what I may add to this question is how did you build that external buy-in from a board perspective and, and municipal perspective to get that done? So that's open to all the panelists. Jamie, I know you provided a response, so feel free to jump in, but for anyone who has to comment, I'll, I'll open the floor. Sure, I, I know every organization probably uh, funds these in different ways and, uh, um, and staffs it <laughs> in, in different ways. Um, for us, our, our funding for the development of the actual plans comes through um, uh, cyclical uh, special uh, capital request to our, our uh, regional municipality, um, specifically to fund a watershed planning coordinator. So we bring on a contract staff person who leads, co coordinates that process. Um, a lot of the, the work is um, still done by um, internal full-time staff to support the, the process as well. Um, what we have found, though, with that particular format is that you're bringing someone who you're bringing someone in to lead a pretty significant process for us um, who doesn't necessarily have that institutional knowledge. And what we've seen happens as a result is uh, the plans may not have that good internal integration because that person just doesn't know who to connect to internally or um, have the time to um, get to know the system and put all the pieces together. And so that that's a challenge that we're working through and that's just how we've had to staff that process right now. Um, others have different formats that they use. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. I don't know if I fully answered the question. I think that's great, Jamie, thank you. And it, it sounds like additional support is needed from a, a staffing perspective. So the idea of using capital dollars or trying to bring in some contract staff to help makes a lot of sense. Loveline, do you have any comments from CVC's perspective? I'm actually not involved in the watershed planning process uh, very much, but um, Janet Ivey, the chair of Laternal is. Um, so if she has any additional comments, she can add it in the chat. So I'm not exactly sure what the trigger was uh, for this round of watershed plan update, but I do know our, our previous update was not done um, holistically since 1956. So we were definitely overdue for one. And we had extremely important strategies completed along the way as well, but we needed that holistic um, review and comprehensive plan pulled together. So that's what uh, Janet's leading for CDC. 
Perfect. That's great. And I can see that Janet commented that it's a combination of general and special levy, which I think would be an approach that many conservation authorities would use. Ian, do you have any comments from your or conservation authority? Uh, I would love to know how to do it too, personally. <laughs> um, <Fair enough. laughs> I am specifically not involved in that directly. Um, we don't have watershed plans or subwatershed plans or haven't for a long time. We managed to get the one I mentioned, the, the integrated watershed management plan completed, fully funded through the Canadian Association of Municipalities, but it took on a very strong climate change angle because that was what the funding was for. So we use that primarily. So we basically we look for alternate funding sources and see if you can kill multiple birds with stones type of approach. So. For sure, that makes a lot of sense. And within the different uh, presentations, what I did hear is that a lot of this information went to the, our board of directors. So there was a lot of board buy-in, a lot of education, a lot of communication in order to get these projects rolling. So that's definitely a first step before moving forward. Okay, thank you everyone for that. So that may lead into one of our other questions. How are your programs integrating climate change knowledge? So maybe I'll start with Ian, if you wanna give us your perspective. Um, short answer, we're gonna to try to. Fair enough. <laughs> um, we don't have a formal climate change program at the MVCA or anything special like that. We did develop a climate change strategy a couple of years ago with a local college, with Georgian College. We had some students work on it. Um, so we have some words on paper. Now the question is to try to integrate it somehow. Um, again, looking to somebody who has some e experience having done that and how we can do it. I mean, we have, again, we're great at that data collection. So we have a lot of data to do it. So now it's a matter of probably just focusing your analysis and reporting on climate change specifically. That's great, thank you. Uh, Loveline, do you have any comments on that particular question? Yeah, um, our program also is somewhat in the same boat, but um, we have just recently pulled together a list of climate change indicators uh, from within our monitoring program. So analyzing them to see how, what value they have in terms of as an indicator themselves, the metrics that we currently monitor, can we refine them in any way to answer specific questions? And we are in the middle of documenting that right now for internal use. And then we will be analyzing all those metrics and indicators over the next, I'm thinking few months, maybe early into next year. And so we do have a corporate climate, climate change strategy as well that um, I know we're probably gonna be working on a joint communication plan on the information and results from that. But then IWIMP itself will also be releasing some communication um, in regards to those results as well. So. Yeah, we're using it and uh, and more on that soon. That's wonderful. We'll look forward to hearing more from CBC on that. From the CLOCA team, any comments regarding integration of climate change knowledge for the work that you've been doing? I, I can jump in first, I guess. Um, I guess through our recent uh, watershed plan update process, it really struck me how um, really the work and the business that conservation authorities have been in for the last 60 plus years is is all about building you know protecting building enhancing uh, healthy watersheds um, and by virtue healthy watersheds are more resilient to change and so it, i guess it really struck me that our watershed plans really really are um, focused on building that that watershed resilience that by virtue will be better able to withstand the impacts of climate change. Um, what's interesting is our, our message around watershed planning and watershed management just hasn't struck the same chord with the general public as, as climate change. And so now we're using that language to um, sort of frame our, our existing uh, watershed management planning work um, which is fine. I'm I'm quite happy to hang my hat, our watershed planning hat, on the climate change movement. Um, but more specifically, I guess we we all know it's coming um, in Durham region at least. Uh, uh, there's a the region has a community climate adaptation plan, like I mentioned, um, that that very clearly sort of uh, 
projects what's going to happen um, through that the development of that plan there are a series of working groups um, that were developed by the region to help support the implementation of that plan um, one is the, one of them is focused on the natural environment and uh, that group really pushed for updated uh, climate change modeling um, from the one that the original plan was based on for the region so that was completed um, a year or two ago um, and the, the the best part about that updated ensemble model is it integrates regional uh, modeling into the, the uh, ensemble model which didn't exist in the, the previous one so we have a lot more refined uh, climate change forecast data now to really integrate into our programs um, we still have gaps though for really addressing it in our watershed plans and and we have a couple of actions related to that including um, doing a natural heritage system uh, climate change vulnerability um, assessment which will really help show us where we need to be focused and where we need to really put attention um, uh, what ecosystems we have to put attention on, I guess, um, given given the, the projected climate change um, forecasts we're seeing. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. And I think the idea of integrating the climate change movement with watershed management, it, it's all related. It, it all ties in together. So we're seeing a lot of that, especially when communicating with our municipalities. Dan or Roy, did you have any further comments on that particular question? Uh, I don't have too much to add. I think Jamie summarized that well. And just adding on to what Loveleen was saying, we, through the horizon scanning needs assessment process, uh, obviously climate change uh, is a something big that we, we need to be aware of and, and think about through the development of the program. And uh, it's possible that we took many of our indicators that we were looking at and tried to tailor them to be able to look specifically at the climate change question better than they would have if we hadn't. Um, examples being looking at how water temperature is changing over time. We primarily based that on the summer season because uh, that is usually when those systems are the most stressed and of interest. Um, but the whole year is changing and um, spring runoffs and all that is going to change and if we start looking at water temperature year round that gives us uh, a more complete picture of what's what's happening in all seasons. I think there's lots of little tweaks you can do to existing uh, indicators that can help build your capacity uh, to answer those uh, those questions and uh, better prepare yourself and link to uh, some of the items that Jamie was saying. Absolutely, thank you for that. And I know that everyone's working to try and fill gaps in their watershed to, to get a better handle of, of how the health of the watershed system is doing and try and, and track those trends. So that kind of leads me into one of our other questions, which are what programs are your different organizations using to an, analyze watershed data? So maybe Dan, you wanna start us off? Uh, yeah, that's a good question and it's, uh... It's a mix, to be honest. We uh, we don't have a great system. Like Lovely hit on this point really well and how important, like it's important to collect data and set up your program, but there's all the data analysis and everything behind that, which is a, a huge monster to overcome. And our, our databases are we're getting better, but they're not in great shape. It doesn't, uh, ideally we'd have some SQL type system that automatically links us to a, uh, some reporting, but we're, it's pretty crude. We use a mix of different free statistical programs, a little bit of R, if I can remember how to do it when I get to it. Um, we're kind of all over the map on that one, to be honest, we're just piece it together. Fair enough. Loveleen, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yep, similar to Dan, um, we're working on it. Um, R seems to be the biggest tool that we're using at the moment. Um, the other great tool we have is our lead analyst. So it's a person, I would say. So uh, Kata Baverlick has really led um, the initiative on this and continues to run with it and coordinate it for our team and has been sharing the information with the other CAs, as I'm sure Dan and Ian can appreciate. Um, so yeah, having the right person who, could, if, even if you don't know the answer or know how to do it, you can research it. 
and then know the right right path to move forward on. So I would say that's the biggest tool. Exactly. And, and I think in our environmental sector, I learn every day that it's it's a small sector. So being able to reach out to the right people with the right skill sets and work together on answering these similar challenges is one of our greatest strengths. Absolutely. Uh, Ian or others, do you have any comments on the programs you're using to analyze your watershed data? Um, the easiest answer is whatever's free. Um, I don't know in terms of like modeling and that what our engineering group uses for flood forecasting or flow trends or things like that. From a water quality point of view, it's Excel, R, when I remember it, and leaning on other people. I've talked to CADA at CBC. We the, the watershed monitoring world amongst CAs is very close. I know almost everybody, so it's not too difficult to send an email or phone somebody to look for those lessons learned, how somebody did something. Oh, I can send you a script in R, or I can do this. So it's relying on other people and then using whatever free resources are available. Um, that may sound like a, I don't want to say a cop out, but a cheap answer, but R is actually incredibly powerful and almost can do more than any of the paid software you can use. So why not use the free one? Exactly. But like a language, R, like if you don't stay on top of R, you lose it. At least that's my experience. So, you know, building that into a continual program where you're constantly using those different tools, I think is also important. Uh, Katrina, I was just going to add um, another gap that we identified through our, our processes recently is, is that about tracking changes in existing conditions yes. and where, where you've had losses um in your watershed and where you've where you've had gains and um we're we're trying to work with our, our planning department as well to capture um both of those but more in particular you can pick up change um or loss i guess through you know regular air photo um interpretation exercises the gains are more difficult to pick up and so we can really only easily track our own restoration activities, you know, in a standard database. It's not a program, it's just, it's just capturing it somehow spatially. Um, but we're also trying to better um, utilize the information that's coming through our planning department um, where subdivisions are being created and there actually is restoration. An example would be, um, you know, uh, the 407, um, highway expansion that went through our jurisdiction. Although there were a lot of losses, there was a lot of compensation that occurred as well. And so that, that should be reflected. It may not show up as um, uh, good quality habitat at the moment, but it, we hope in, in time, some of that will actually result in what it was intended to. And so that's another gap that we're trying to address just internally. Thanks, Jamie. I think that's a really good point and, and making sure that all of our different departments understand how everything is, is connected. I know from a, a planning perspective, all of our planners tend to be ecologists at some point uh, in pro providing some of that restoration knowledge and those recommendations. So trying to get everybody involved and in, in making that integrated system work internally is, is a really good point. So for our next question, Roy, I may just ask you to, to speak to one of the answers you had in the chat. I thought it was really comprehensive. So someone asked, how are restoration activities prioritized? Would you be able to highlight uh, your answer for everybody? Uh, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so uh, Cloca, before I uh, joined Cloca, developed a restoration prioritization tool and I was very impressed with uh, the information that it contained and the methodology that it had for prioritizing all of the catchments within the watersheds. So I'm always using that either to uh, uh, look for areas where we could do targeted outreach, uh, depending on the prioritization score, or to, you know, if we have some um, fortuitous just uh, landowner wanting tree planting, for example, we can look at the catchment that they're in and see what benefits that that project would have within that catchment. So it's, it's kind of, it's either going one way or the other you're assessing the uh, restoration that you've done or you're looking at opportunities for restoration. That's great, thank you. Uh, our other panelists, you have any comments on how your organization prioritizes restoration work? 
I can step in for a second. Um, sure. I am speaking for a program that I don't work for, so I may get something slightly wrong, but um, our restoration program relies very heavily on the manager of restoration. So it's kind of knowledge in the head of the staff person. He has an intimate knowledge of the watershed. He's been working at MVCA for literally decades. Um, and he knows areas just from the watershed intimately that need restoration. Um, we do, and I hope through the integrated process that I'm working through is to develop tools to formalize, kind of like Roy was talking about, where to go and point to the future, because um, people don't work forever. They're eventually going to retire. So we don't want to lose knowledge, but we also want to formalize the process. So yeah, right now it's it's all based off just experience. That's great. And I know there's a lot of, of history within the organizations for those who have worked with us for so long. So having that knowledge transfer to the different departments and to the different staff is going to be a huge piece for, for many conservation authorities that I'm aware of. Other comments or, or responses from the panelists? I guess I can just add, you know, prioritization is, is great because we all have limited dollars um, for ecological restoration. So our prioritization model is sort of based on the idea that what will give us the biggest ecological bang for the limited buck. But at the end of the day, the reality, and Roy sees it all the time, is that we're, we are, we're also opportunistic. Um, we're not getting... <laughs> Uh, the private landowners necessarily um, in those priority sections all the time. We're getting landowners who have a vested interest, and we're not turning them down if if we if we have the funding to support them as well. And so, um, but if we are limited by dollars, then we'd certainly be focusing on uh, on those priority areas. And outreach is also focused on those priority areas to try to get you know, those landowners interested who haven't been just knocking on our door. Absolutely. When it comes to prioritization, I know there's different approaches. And one discussion we've had at, on our team is you want to prioritize based on the needs of the watershed, but sometimes you're prioritizing based on the funding opportunity or the political pressure or some of the other considerations. So, you know, being able to weigh those different pieces as well, I think is, uh, is a good conversation to have. Loveline, you have some comments? Yes, um, at CBC, we also have a restoration performance monitoring program. So it's a separate monitoring program, but we work very closely with each other. They actually draw on our uh, expertise and sometimes our staffing and equipment as well. Uh, we work, we share everything, um, but we also help them track the success of their projects as well. So help not just with data collection, perhaps study design a little bit, uh, but also how successful are their projects. So um, using the data we collect for our integrated watershed monitoring program and giving them thresholds or targets from where they can um, define how successful their project is. Um, we also help with the invasive species strategy and um, that CBC just recently released, I believe it was last year. And they also heavily use on our, our monitoring data as well. So we look, work very closely with the restoration team at, at CBC. That's great. If I, if I can ask a follow up then, how did you determine those thresholds for, for restoration? What, what benchmarks are you using? We don't necessarily have thresholds developed for everything right now. We're actually in the process of doing that. Um, but the ones that we do have, we do uh, absolutely share with them. And if we don't have it, then we can work together to develop uh, the best, best scientific solution based on knowledge that we have at the time. Nice. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Any further thoughts before I move on to a different question? I guess on that threshold topic, it is, I don't know, going through the development of the restoration prioritization um, program at CLOCA, it is, you get into all those really interesting questions of how do you, once you decide what layers you're going to use and what you're going to be somewhat directing your prioritization on the available data that you have to you you have to start thinking, well, how are we gonna prioritize these things? Are we gonna take our good areas and make them bigger and better? Or do we start looking at urban areas and trying to improve things? And uh, that kind of goes back to ecological thresholds or, or some urban areas, it's, they're, they're long done. They're, they're so far from meeting some sort of uh, ecological improvement 
there isn't value there, or is there is there value in public appreciate uh, the small improvements, even if you don't see a huge gain in ecological integrity out of it? So it's a, it's another one of those uh, topics that's really interesting, and you can you can get into the weeds a little bit on it, but there's uh, certainly lots of value, um, and, and even understanding what your maybe you have a climate change focus, maybe you have um, um, wetland folks, whatever it happens to be, there can be lots of different lenses to consider. Absolutely. And I think that brings us back to some of the points that you talked about in your presentation, Dan, about, you know, how do we set ourselves up for success? What's our question? What's that niche focus that we want to really look at? Because it's a very intimidating process to try and answer everything all at the same time. We do have to, you know, integrate the different pieces, but I think really trying to narrow that down and making sure that those thresholds and priorities do successfully answer your question help at least guide the process moving forward. So that's a great comment. Okay, so one of the questions that uh, the committee was interested in for our panelists is, can citizen science help fill the gaps in an integrated monitoring program? So I throw that out to the team and whoever would like to, to start with that one, then please let me know. I can start off. Go for it. <laughs> Everyone's afraid to start. <laughs> um, I, I guess for our answer, it's uh, maybe. Um, I think it depends. <laughs> I think it depends on um, do you have a clear question that you're trying to answer, and then can that program help you answer that specific question? You don't want to collect data for the sake of collecting data and and um, and not do anything with it. So. I know we've participated in, in things like the bio blitz that the Royal Ontario Museum did a few years ago, and that was successful from an, uh, more of an inventory or characterization standpoint, but not necessarily from a monitoring standpoint. There was nothing new we necessarily learned for, from IWIMP, um, but a fascinating exercise as well, and it got people engaged with the program as well. So from a communication standpoint, that was a success. Um, and things like iNaturalist, um, which is an app that many people use, uh, the public can use to just um, download their observations and get confirmation of observations, has also been um, interesting to us as well. So we've been looking to that from a monitoring perspective and from an inventory perspective, just to see what's out there and to help us realize um, places that we can't see all the time, what people are seeing, and perhaps we need to pivot, as Dan noted, um, and consider new threats or challenges along the way. Yeah, no, that's great. And one of the challenges we've talked about is the quality control of, of data that comes in from citizen science. So I, I like your comment about the characterization versus the monitoring. If they sometimes are different things, they can complement, but you, you may have a different approach with the, the, those two pieces. I, I would second everything that Loveline said. Um, it's definitely something that we've been looking at and wanting to incorporate more. Um, at this point, we really do find it's um, a bit more of an education and outreach uh, program for us, or there's certain situations like the bio blitz where you can really characterize an inventory of a, of a property we don't have much uh, information on. Um, that being said, there's, there's certain communities, like the birding community is just incredible the amount of knowledge that they have. So. We, for um, like our coastal wetland monitoring program, there's definitely a, a public component to that. But we also have to balance it with um, when you have these integrated programs that are linked to management actions, there can be quite a few financial repercussions to a, a positive or negative trend. And we have to have a lot of confidence and have a lot of checks and balances in, in that data. So it is something that we're careful about and, and always looking for opportunities but it's um we haven't had we haven't really incorporated it into our, our main integrated program at this point yeah that's fair thanks for your perspective dan other panelists i can fully back up what lovely and dan are saying we've as i'm thinking of developing the program it'd be great to have community input community data citizen science and that type of stuff just need to make sure it fits and answers the questions we want to answer. Um, otherwise, it falls into the problem that we as an organization had in the past is just collecting more data. Um, it needs to be fo focused. Um, and we've got some great naturalist groups in the area who would work with us to help focus it. Um, my background and my job at MVCA is water. 
So I wouldn't be the one reaching out to, as Dan said, like the birding community in that. Um, and I'm a little bit more reticent to use citizen science because I can see problems with sending a bunch of general citizens out and asking them to go stand in rivers. Um, I don't want to find out that half the people who volunteered got swept away in a storm because they went and decided to sample at that point. There's just such a big health and safety aspect with working around water. So it's trying to figure out what's a low hanging fruit that can be done safely by the greater community that still provides value and answers questions. And that's a question I don't have an easy answer to right now, but it's still something I'd love to. If somebody has great ideas, I'd love to talk to them about it and how they can fit in. Um, actually, totally on an aside, just the past week or so, I received an email from the Métis Nation of Canada, who is looking to do citizen science water quality monitoring with their nation and asked basically, where are we sampling so that they don't duplicate it? And yeah, by all means, I mean, they're, they want to develop their own program in that. I, I left the door open if they want to speak with me just because I've been doing this forever. Um, but I'm going to supply them with the information. And yeah, I hope they get some great data and advance the greater community of understanding for, for everybody. So That's great. Thanks, Ian. I know part of the conversation we've had with our team is sometimes the citizen science aspect, it takes a lot to coordinate. So being able to have that capacity and not only the data piece, but also to either train or, you know, keep other um, other groups motivated and, and uh, achieving the targets that you want can be challenging. Roy, you have some thoughts? Yeah, I agree with what uh, what you just said actually about uh, you know training. So um, there's lots of opportunities with uh, uh, forest woodlot owners, for example, where if we are doing a managed forest plan for them, we're sort of helping them get to know their woodlot. We're helping them to identify invasive species for example, or uh, you know, even tree pests and diseases, we're asking them to incorporate those uh, those things into their plans, so they actually uh, you know get fairly fairly well versed at uh, at identifying these uh, things. So even if it's um, identify the extent of invasive dog strangling vine on their property, right? They might do a bit of mapping, and that kind of feedback is always useful coming back from landowners within the watershed. So I mean. And we're always there to guide them with, uh, with helping to identify or you know to to give them feedback wherever they need the help. So that's an opportunity for sure. That's great. And the more education and communication, as Lovely was saying, out there, I think the the more collaboration opportunities there are in the future, and, and the better, better knowledge basis to support our programming. Uh, Jamie, did you have any thoughts? I was just going to add that. Um... You know, Dan hit the nail on the head or everyone has around the confidence in the data um, and that challenge with community um, and citizen science. But I think we also have to remember that there's, you know, tremendous value in um, having integrate or engaging with the community in, in the work that we do. And one way is through some of these uh, citizen science based programs. Um, lovely mentioned the bio blitz we did one a couple of years ago and it was it was an, you know it was an excellent um, event for engaging with our broader broader community um, some who don't participate in our normal um, programs um, but and I think it's important though to be honest up front about why you're undertaking an event like that is it for for good quality data, or is it for engagement? And if it's for engagement, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's you know, really valuable as well. It's just being honest up front about why you're, you're going forward with, with a particular event or, or program. That's a great comment. Thanks, Jamie. Oh, Ian, you have a follow-up? Uh, just another quick thought. Um, I really, as I'm going through this process, of developing a strategy is I really would like to figure out how to get First Nation traditional knowledge into this. I mean, it's whether you call it citizen science or whatever, it's it's added knowledge to paint that picture pre-colonialization and all that, because we don't have data that goes back forever. And I want to know what the area looks like beforehand and how it's changed. And But I am not an expert. I do not know how to get that involved properly, yet I want to. 
That's a great question. Do any of our panelists have experience with incorporating traditional knowledge? Not yet. Okay, maybe an area to explore for sure. Uh, so we've got a couple questions in our Q and A. Um, the first one is, how do you deal with don't know what you don't know for emerging threats? So I can see, lovely, you may have some some thoughts on that one. Uh, if I continue the question, it's, do you regularly use research literature to adjust your inventory of data capture, microplastics being an example? You want to maybe take us off? Sure. Yeah. Um... So we do stay on top of, of literature um, and the way we're organized at our organization is for a monitoring program. We have identified key people to be the experts or leads for each of these different systems or attributes that we monitor. And so the monitoring program itself stays on top of the science um, constantly. We're, we're looking at literature, we're um, staying in touch with our partners, and so we're constantly scanning for that. We're also scanning our data. So if we do see something that doesn't look right, we need to dig in a little bit further and perhaps what, that's where a cause and effect program uh, comes into effect. So um, I think the third piece is um, what value does that one particular piece of information bring um, to your agency as well? So perhaps microplastics, it may not be quite within our mandate at a conservation authority. Um, air quality might be up for debate as well. So there's a few things out there that just perhaps aren't in our realm at the moment, um, but worth discussing and considering. Absolutely, that's great. Any other comments or feedback from our panelists on that question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Lovelyne summarized that well. Uh, same at Cloco, we just try to keep an eye on the scientific community and what's happening. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we have to keep in mind what, what the question is that our morning programs answer and whether, um, that each particular emerging threat can help contribute to that or whether it is a, a special project that we partner with academia or someone to help us, us answer that uh, more specifically. So it's definitely something that we keep an eye on. Um, again, you have to factor in costs. You, if you have a long-term monitoring program, you don't want to substitute in indicators every couple, take one out, add one in. The, the, of this program really depends on it being long term so you want to keep your base there and if you do see emerging threats that it's fairly cost effective it contributes to our overall question then we, uh, we certainly consider adding those in thanks dan and i'm sure there's opportunities to if we're not the the right organization to answer those threats we can partner or collaborate on, on opportunities to try and integrate that as best as we can Others on the panel, any thoughts? I would just back up what they say, except our program is very small and very tight. So mm -hmm. we don't have the capacity to try new and emerging things. We would like to know about them and see what we can do if it can fit within existing programs. Otherwise, it's all got to be through special projects, finding funding from anywhere and everywhere, whether it's a local municipality or Trillium Foundation or somewhere. Um, yeah, it, it's not doesn't fit into the realm of our small monitoring program. And I see a chat comment from Lynn Collins. Yes, I would be interested in talking with you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Connecting the right people. It's what we do. Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jamie or Roy, any thoughts on that question? Um, the only other thing from my perspective, Dad, is that uh, you know, especially for smaller mid-sized CAs, some of the larger um, conservation authorities are doing phenomenal work um, and pushing the boundaries all the time. And we've certainly benefited from our, our neighbors um, and others in the conservation authority network. Um, conservation authorities are, are more than welcome to share resources and, and those larger CAs who have have uh, more staff to to be on the cusp of of uh, new data and, and changing science. Um, other smaller CAs can leverage that that experience and expertise, and so um, yeah, it it works works well. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. I'll offer up any final thoughts from Roy, and then I think we'll wrap up. I think my cover colleagues covered it pretty well there. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So 
Uh, again, I'd this session has been brought to you by the Laternal Steering Committee, and I would like to thank all of those members who helped pull it together, uh, including Janet Ivey, the chair of our Laternal uh, Conference, Jamie Joudry, the conference program chair, Nikisha Mohammed and Jane Lewington of Conservation Ontario, Holly Sember, Mar Mario Malay, and Karen Anderson of Allset Inc. And I want to thank all of our panelists again. You've done a great job today, had some wonderful discussion, and I'm sure many of our participants will want to reach out to you for furthering that conversation. And I'd like to thank all of our, our participants. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come listen to this really important topic. We had over 300 people register and over 180 participants at one point uh, this morning. So really excited about having everyone part of this discussion. Um, so as we continue to reimagine the future of our conference, we hope you enjoyed today and we, we'd like to keep in touch. We do have a few more sessions coming up. As I mentioned, this is the first of six webinars this fall. So uh, take a look online, we'll be advertising those and please keep watch for our next webinar, which is reimagining the CA lands for the future on October 19th. And one more thing to do before you leave, if we could ask everyone to complete our last polls, uh, which will be popping on the screen shortly to help us uh, improve our webinars and uh, continue this moving forward. So as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Laternal Symposium website for anyone to watch, as well as the presentation and resources. Uh, just please give us a couple days to get them posted. Thank you again to everyone who participated today uh, for making the Watershed Cycle Monitoring, Planning and Restoration webinar very successful. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll talk soon. Take care.